All right, I'm going to give it to the governor. Okay. So when she starts to speak, you can just think low. Okay. Not, and, I'll, and I'll tell you two minutes. Not yet, though. Yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and similar to last time, you know, we had that little kid up there that I missed. 
Yeah. You know, if you if you can kind of cue me in when I yeah if I miss somebody, it was a little kid that had a you know great question at me, and I was just about to cut it's it. It's not yeah. live yet. So it, 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 they'll, they'll bring up the sound when you come up to stage. Yes, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't. Have our secret discussions yes. known. <laughs> we don't want me to say anything that might get on. The only other thing is if there really is a conversation, so the first question can be directed to me, the question about mothers and daughters and singing. But you all can jump in, and it's just a conversation. So, you know, I give you a couple comments. I know this time. Oh, so which I can't really read because I don't have my glasses. Great. Okay, so don't, I, I, do not isolate the comments. Just kind of talk back and forth. Can we each have a mic, sir? We have very talented <laughs> technicians that will put it. Yeah, so Let me just say one other thing, which is, you know, this is not my profession, so I'm going to try to keep going on a little long, and I'll try to switch to somebody else, and I think it's a I'm not, you know, don't take it as an intentional thing. It's, you know, I just, I need to move on, and I, you know, I just, so. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> You'll be next to her. In 1998, the nation was gripped by the brutal beating and death of 21-year-old Matthew Shepard. Judy Shepard, while still grieving the loss of her oldest son, rose from the ashes of the tragedy as an activist, striving to replace hate with understanding, compassion, and acceptance. Today, Judy travels the country speaking with audiences of all ages and sizes, keeping Matthew's dreams, beliefs, and aspirations alive in the hearts and minds of all Americans, and working for a safer world for all young people. But my family has lost our beloved Matthew because he was gay. Judy is currently on the board of directors of the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender equal rights organization. She is also the executive director of the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which supports diversity programs in education and helps youth organizations establish environments where young people can feel safe and be themselves.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Jean Shaheen. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We want to welcome all of you tonight to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We're proud this evening to partner with the Human Rights Campaign to bring you this vital conversation on being young and gay in America. You know, talk about it is the theme of this year's National Coming Out Day. And in the 18 years since National Coming Out Day started, there's been a real, been real progress towards understanding and acceptance of being gay in America. A lot of that is because of young people and their families all across this country who have been willing to speak out about what it means to be gay. We're very pleased tonight to continue this conversation with our panelists. We have moderating this evening is Cheryl Giles, who is the Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling at the Harvard Divinity School. With her are Mike Glatz, Chris, Chris Medeiros, and Maya Keyes, and a true American hero, Judy Shepard. Judy. Yes, you can clap. <laughs> Your courage has inspired millions of young people and their families, and we are so pleased to have all of you here this evening. Thank you. To borrow Charles Dickens' opening line in A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In recent years, the gay community has witnessed the kind of changes we never expected to see in our lifetime. Gay youth and adults who once sought protection in cover and secrecy are supported and protected by family, friends, legislators, clergy, schools, and communities. Same-sex marriage is legal in Canada and several European nations, as well as in Massachusetts. Gay-straight alliances are working to break down barriers in public high schools across the country. It would seem we are making progress, and indeed we are. Still, it is the worst of times. Hate crimes continue. Gay youth, tortured by rejection, harassment, and identity, commit suicide. In many areas of the country, any acknowledgement that one is gay, any public display of affection by a same-sex couple invites contempt or worse. In the past week alone, the Boston Globe reported Pope Benedict XVI is about to bar even chaste homosexuals from seminaries because their orientation is rooted in a personality disorder. In Massachusetts, many conservative religious communities of all denominations have launched a major initiative to gain signatures for a vote to throw out same-sex marriage. In Texas, a trial began in a civil lawsuit brought by a gay inmate against state prison officials because he was sexually assaulted almost daily for 18 months. The officials ignored his pleas for protection from rapes and instead told him to fight or get a boyfriend who could defend him. In tonight's forum, we'll talk about the promise and the pain of being young and gay in America. How do we keep our gay youth safe and healthy when they're getting so many contrary messages or they are caught in the crossfire of our current culture wars over homosexuality? My guests are four individuals who know both the promise and the pain of being young and gay in America. Please welcome Judy Shepard, a mother whose life was irrevocably changed seven years ago when her gay son Matthew was murdered in an anti-gay hate crime. Despite the horror of losing her child to a senseless, charity, a senseless tragedy, Judy has become a tireless advocate for tolerance. She and her husband have established a foundation to raise awareness and to work for gay and lesbian equality and hate crime legislation. My next guest is a bright and accomplished activist whose parents her father is conservative politician Alan Keyes, threw her out of their home and withdrew all financial support when she publicly disclosed as a lesbian. 
However, Maya continues to refer to him with love, respect, understanding, and admiration. This year, Maya was appointed the Wanda Alston Point Scholar from the Point Foundation, a nonprofit organization which provides financial support, mentoring, and hope to meritorious students who are marginalized due to sexual orientation or gender identity. In addition, she has never ceased being a tireless advocate for LGBT homeless youth, speaking at rallies to raise awareness for a problem that is often overlooked within our community. Mike Glatz has traveled all over America interviewing small town lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, questioning, and straight allied youth, and has produced a moving documentary, Jim and Bold, which focuses on the story of Jim Wheeler, a gay teen from rural Pennsylvania, who committed suicide in 1997 when the abuse and harassment of his peers became too unbearable. Mike is co-founder of Young Gay America and editor-in-chief of YGA Magazine. He received the National Role Model Award from Equality Forum in 2003. Mike, his partner Benji Nikem, and the Young Gay America Project have appeared in over 70 magazines, newspapers, and television and radio shows. And finally, my fourth guest is Christopher Medeiros, Director of Emissions, Recruitment, and Financial Aid at Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, where he also teaches theology and sexuality. Chris holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from Providence College, a master's degree in counseling psychology from Lesley University, and a master's of divinity degree from Episcopal Divinity School. He is a volunteer at Fenway Community Health Center, and does presentations and preaching on diversity issues at area churches and for other organizations. Please welcome our guest tonight. I'd like to begin with uh, a question that I want to throw out to you, Judy, uh, and, and perhaps uh, Maya and the rest of you can join in. Uh, and the question is, how do mothers and daughters, like the two of you, find resiliency in the face of tragedy and rejection and manage to not only survive personally, but to become modern symbols of courage in fighting against oppression, intolerance, and violence? Resiliency, I guess that would be the answer for me. Um, when I lost Matt, it became a matter of uh, whether or not my husband and I were going to <coughs> as it were, take up the cause for man and his friends, his community, or go back to being uh, just us. It became obvious that we could not go home and do nothing. Uh, that would have been uh, insanity for me. I, I felt such an obligation and a desire to try and make Matt's dreams come true. So that my personal pain, my personal loss, became secondary to the message I could share of what happened to my son and it happens because hate goes unchecked. And there's a way to deal with that, and there's a way to deal with people who learn hate and how they need to um, unlearn it, and how as a society we can help them do that, and how parents can really be parents. And that was, um, that was my message, and still is. Um, well, for me, I guess it wasn't really something that I thought about so much. Like, I never really set out to become an activist. It was, I guess, more along the same lines of I I initially saw a lot of other homeless kids going through all these horrible things, and then I later became homeless myself. And it was more a question of just not being able to sit by and do nothing when I saw so many other people sitting by and doing nothing. Like, you see people dying out on the streets, and you don't really stop to think, well, I'm just going to sit here and be depressed. You think, I, I have to do something about it. I have to stop this. So I don't think it was really that hard to kind of get past the difficulty of the situation because if I hadn't done something about it, I would have just sat there sinking in the depression and that's no, not really any way to live. But by, by becoming an activist and doing something about it, you can turn a, a bad situation into something positive, which doesn't just help other people. It sort of helps you get through it yourself. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you want to add to that? As you've traveled around the country, what, what do you hear kids saying about uh, fighting well, oppression and, and sort of I think Maya's, Maya's point is actually wonderful. Um, there is that decision that you can make at any given point where you can let something awful happen to you. Uh, you can focus on the negative that's coming toward you. Um, you can just kind of 
whittle in, away into nothing, or you can take the other option, which is obviously to look at things positively. And once you look at things positively, then you feel the sense of energy, you know, and all of a sudden you are then doing something and it gives you a purpose and then other people come and want to be part of that. And so you're seeing this in all of these small towns and it's amazing. I, uh, the story of a girl, Liz um, Benfield in Pueblo, Colorado, when she was 16 years old, she found that in her very small, well not very small, Pueblo's not that small, it's kind of like a mid-sized town, um, not too far from you guys, but um, essentially in her town, she found that there was no real organized gay anything, no pride, nothing. So she and her friend Anna, both under 18, sat at their local IHOP and decided that they were going to start their first gay pride. So they did. Why not? And there were 300 people that came to the gay pride. And there were protesters that, that came to the gay pride. And Liz and Anna walked up to the protesters and just said, we wanted to thank you for being here. Um, all publicity is good publicity. Thank you very much. <laughs> and this is, you know, I mean, She's 16, she has her head shaved with a mohawk and tons of piercings and fierce, and she says that her dream is to be on CNN with her name and activist running underneath it. And as she says, she doesn't want to move to Denver, she doesn't want to move to Boston because you can't make as much of an impact um, in a larger city. In a, in a small town, you can make an impact, you can feel like you've got a purpose, and you can feel like you're making a difference. And that energy, that, that vigor, <coughs> Is, is not just in Liz, it's not just in Maya, but it's in a lot of kids out there. It's amazing. Chris, you wanna come on this? I think that um, what's happening in some of the uh, more progressive churches is that um, they are beginning to respond sort of at an institutional level, in a way, and are seeing that they have to. Um, churches that have begun sort of wrestling with sexuality in general, um, as that begins, then the issue of youth, and I'm also thinking specifically of churches that have done outreach to homeless people are beginning to see how many homeless youth, and of those homeless youth, a very disproportionate number of GLBTQ youth. Um, so I think that something is happening. I think that, and um, we're probably gonna talk about this a lot more later, but um, the, the press in America right now about religion, specifically Christianity, has really painted one picture, a picture of right-wing um, churches and conservative religion, when there really is a very large movement of more progressive um, churches that are beginning to come to meet this challenge. And hopefully, the idea of these institutions coming to, to, to deal with this issue, as well as individual activists, can come together and accomplish more than either can do alone. Oh, that's a nice segue into my next question, which is, <laughs> uh, religious opposition to gay rights is well known. However, few people realize that there are strong religious coalitions in all faith traditions that su support the rights and dignity of GLBT, GLBTQ people. What can these pro more progressive religious coalitions do to support GLBT youth and make their perspective more prominent in the public debate? You just commented on that a little bit, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the organizing that's taking place, uh, not just on the side that's more sort of uh, opposition side, but on the more progressive side, um, mm -hmm. where actually, actually institutional, um, uh, um, various institutions are gathering to, to kind of create change. Um, first of all, to say that probably most of my remarks are specifically going to deal with Christianity because that's the world that I operate in, mm -hmm. but I think this is happening in other religious communities as well, in Judaism, in Islam, in Buddhism. Um, so to sort of keep that context, um, but I think that um, the way you worded the question about uh, prominence, and I would also say visibility, has been one of the issues, is that those churches that are doing um, things to help um, GLBTQ youth are not getting press. It's much more sort of the headlines of Pope Benedict's edicts and Jerry Faldwell and, and all of these kind of people, when really, um, so, uh, what I would say is in America right now, there's sort of, in Christianity, a, a division and this is somewhat artificial, of kind of three tiers. One is the right wing that we hear about, the Jerry Falwell, the independent fundamentalist churches, Southern Baptist Convention, the Roman Catholic Church that are making very clear statements that homosexuality is wrong, a sin or disorder. Um, and then at the opposite end, of, there are liberal churches such as Unitarian Universalist Association, um, United Church of Christ, um, the Metropolitan Community Church, they're exactly saying the opposite, they're taking their faith and making those as statements to fight for um, GLBTQ rights. And then in the middle is a much larger group of 
the mainline Protestant denominations, uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, and my own Episcopal Church, which thankfully um, elected the first openly gay bishop in our church um, at our last convention, but still has a long way to go on marriage and clergy and some other issues. Um, so I think that what I hope that these churches need uh, are going to do is take stands, take loud and proud stands and not sort of equivocate. Um, there's all kinds of movements, um, open and affirming and um, more light that these churches are becoming open to GLBTQ issues. Um, but I think it's more than just putting a rainbow flag in front of your church, is what will you do? Um, will you have a shelter? If, if you have a homeless shelter, will you find, or the, a soup kitchen, to specifically deal with um, kids that come to you and kids with sexuality questions? Will you welcome someone who comes to your church questioning their sexuality, who might be in drag, who might be a girl who's looking a butcher, all of these different things? Are, how open are your church doors? Um, and that's, I think, the important thing for progressives that may intellectually put that rainbow flag in front of their churches, but need to now create institutions and ways to deal to actually welcome and work with activists. But would you say that part of that, that, that the progressive movement also means that we as uh, GLBTQ folks have to be have to stand up within our church traditions and take the lead on some of this. Uh, at times Absolutely, kind of push it. I, I think that's really the only way change happens. I, I think if you're waiting for large institutions to change, the only way it changes, I think, is at the grassroots. I mean, one quick example in in my own church, in the Episcopal Church, women's ordination was debated. Some people would say at nauseum. <laughs> until um, a group of women uh, found a bishop and said enough and had what was called an irregular ordination and boom, women's ordination became a fact. It wasn't through debate, it was through action. Um, and while Jean Robinson's um, election was something that went through regular church things in our church, um, it also happened because the people of New Hampshire said that we need to make a change, that we want this person to be our bishop. So. Um, that's the, the only way institutional change happens to me is by people. And as you said, people within their tradition saying, I am this faith and I am GLBT and I, am, and, and I refuse to choose. I, was, I agree with what he said about, with what Chris said about um, action being more important than debate. I think that what a lot of religious institutions can do to do more for gay youth is to do more for gay youth. Um, to, <laughs> <laughs> to have programs that are specifically oriented towards GLBTQ youth because even in churches that are very open and very welcoming, there's still just in the GLBTQ community such a, I guess, stereotype picture of what religious institutions are like, that if they're not specifically targeting queer youth, then queers aren't going to come to them. They're not going to, even if the church itself is in theory affirming and open and welcoming, People aren't going to know about it until they start having, you know, shelters that they run specifically targeted towards queer youth. The programs they have that have education programs specifically for LGBTQ youth. So I think that if, if they did start actually doing more, then people would realize the churches that are more affirming and welcoming as opposed to the ones that aren't. And she's right. And, and, and while the, what's interesting too is at the same time at the organizational level that things aren't happening as quickly. The individuals themselves, especially the younger people, are taking matters into their own hands in a lot of places. Um, I've been to, for example, well, to, one thing that's really happening right now, it's coming up soon, I'm not sure when, but um, the organization Soul Force, which is a religious organization that works to um, end uh, what they call spiritual violence. Um, the head of this uh, new thing called the Equality Ride, um, his name is Jake Rytan, he's 24 years old, and the Equality Ride is modeled after the Freedom Ride, which was African-American uh, freedom through the South um, to raise awareness in, in the 50s and the 60s. And um, they have the same organizer who created the Freedom Ride. That's, uh, we like that sound. <laughs> the, the same organizer who created the Freedom Ride and helped Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is helping these guys do the Equality Ride and they're looking for volunteers. So if anybody's interested, what the Equality Ride is going to do is essentially go to all these homophobic, really homophobic Christian schools. So they're going to go to Oral Roberts, they're going to go to Bob Jones, they're going to go to Liberty University, they're going to go to BYU, 
And these are the schools where if you're gay, you either get kicked out or you gotta go to shock treatment. And I'm not kidding, that no, happens. Not at all. Um, and, and they're gonna go and they're going to really send out a message that you know, what you're doing is wrong, that you need to provide a more well-rounded view of the Bible, and they're gonna distribute materials. So this is happening next year, and this is a young guy organizing this, 24-year-old organizing this. And I was in Salt Lake City, and, and I got, we got an email. We, uh, a lot of the places we go, uh, people contact us, obviously, and say, well, we'd like Young Gay America to come and interview us and tell our story. One was a group, the Gay Latter-day Saints Young Adults. Now, you get, sometimes we get emails, and, and as open-minded as I might think I am, I still pass judgment. So I get an email from the Gay Latter-day Saints Young Adults, and I figure there's maybe like three or four guys just hanging out, like, shaking. <laughs> <laughs> And we walked, and, and I know that's judgmental, but I mean, you hear about Mormons and you think that they're, they're so anti-gay. Well, we walk into this place and there was 50 guys. And it was granted it was an only all men's group. So there's, we can talk about that on another level if you want to, but that's separate. The fact is they, they had uh, 50 guys exercising the princ Mormon principles of family. The Mor Mormon religion is all about family. And what they were doing is bringing this family of queer, young, Mormons together. And they were doing this on their own, and they were doing this empoweringly. It was, that's not a word, but it was amazing. <laughs> so it's amazing what's happening is all I'm trying to say. People are fighting for, for, for their place in these religious faiths. It's, it's really inspiring. Uh, and I'll just run Mike to sense what Maya said about uh, your churches having um, affinity groups within their church, gay and, gay and lesbian support groups within the Episcopal Church or the Catholic Church or the Mormon Church or, um, or at mosque or any of those because they do exist, they're everywhere. Uh, they do not have programs for youth. Youth is an area where they're very uh, inexperienced, they know nothing, they are still judgmental about stereotypes of the uh, troubled youth or youth at risk or uh, all of those things. Plus, I, I really think they fear uh, parental um, retribution if they try to gear these programs toward the kids. Uh, I, I really think that's a, that's a big issue in churches too. They just like a hands off on our kids. Um, we don't want you to be addressing this issue with them yet. And that's the other thing I think progressive churches really can do is besides working with youth is actually to work with adults and parents and general education about issues that are specific to queer youth. Um, getting parents to talk about these issues before their issues, getting, talking to adults of these issues before they have children, to make this part of, perhaps, in a church, the social justice kind of ethos. Um, and I wanted to quickly piggyback on one thing that Maya said. Um, one thing I think that I have found when I'm out in the secular world or when, I, when I'm not at my school or, or talking to churches is when I hear um, GLBTQ people talking about religion and Christianity, they often say, the, when they're talking negatively, we'll say Christianity um, and think of all of Christianity as being right-wing Christianity. So that's, I think, the first way, to, going back to the question you originally asked, is to immediately challenge that stereotype and actually to not just challenge it, but flip it, to say that um, actually Christianity can be a force of fighting oppression, mm -hmm. not causing it. Do, do we have another kind of... So that, well, just, yeah, on, on that, like um, our film Jim and Bold played in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and uh, this is a small town. Um, and, and, and Fred Phelps, you all have heard of him. Um, he came with, well, he didn't come. He sent his brothers and sisters, because it's all a big thing there, family thing, that they all come to protest. You're very familiar with these folks. Yeah, I know Fred. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they came to protest the screening of the film in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, on religious grounds. And in response, seven area churches in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, came up. And they, they brought their families, and they, this was hundreds of people from seven churches in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, came to counter protest in the name of Christianity, saying, you are not Christian, we are. And there's 100, 300, 500 of us, and 10 of you get out of our town. And that's the type mm -hmm. of stuff that, that can happen, exactly. and it is happening. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Uh, one of the traits uh, fairly common to teens is the belief that they're invincible to danger. While we have made great strides, the reality of homophobia and its consequences is still a clear and, and present danger. How do we foster empowerment and confidence in gay youth and still keep them aware of the dangers that exist? I'd like to start with that one. <laughs> um, two words, 
that come out. Uh, more is done when not just young people, but everyone comes out. Because we need to eliminate the stereotypes to make it safe. And it's a catch-22, I agree. There is a level of fear, uh, at all levels of fear, in all parts of the community. But until we start the step of everyone being who they are and being out and making it recognizable and OK and a common thing, then the fear is going to exist for everybody. And if you hide who you are, you're sheltering yourself in this fear. And people see that fear. It makes you vulnerable to them. If you're not confident in who you are and you're not who you are, then you're inviting this on yourself. Um, and I saw that in Matt. I, I saw that in Matt. I saw him as a victim of um, other people's uh, bigotry or ignorance, if you will. I, I really think ignorance is at the root of all of it. But I saw his reaction in a loss of self-esteem. And he carried himself like a victim. Uh, he carried himself like a victim sometimes. And I think that invites people to, uh, to attack. He was not confident in who he was. And do you know why? Because society told him he was wrong. And society can only tell him that when everyone is still closeted, um, when everyone is out in who they are and having these wonderful discussions and making it OK to be who you are. Then the sense of pride and strength will show. Uh, and I really think that's a, that's a real empowerment to our young people. We have to make it OK to be out. I think that for me, this question ties in a lot with the first question, and it can in some cases be a case of activism, a case of taking um, the fear that there is sometimes when coming out and, and turning it into something empowering, something that you're, you're like, well, I'm going, I'm going to come out and I'm going to make it easier for other people to do that after me. I'm going to make the world safer. I also like to point out that that question used the word dangerous three times. That makes it sound like a really, really dangerous, scary world, which it can be at times. but. Uh, but when you get involved in LGBTQ issues and get involved in, in helping other people, um, it, it does make you aware of what can go on in the world because you get to see some really horrible stories of what happens to people. But at the same time, you get a feeling of you're not powerless over those situations. You can do something to change it and improve it. I'll, I'll, I'll actually respond to two things that you said. Well, one, the first thing is the dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. The world is not that dangerous when it comes down to it. Um, there are obviously horrible, awful things that happen in the world, but when it really comes down to it, in terms of the, the, the young people that are out of the closet today, there's 3,500 gay straight alliances across America in, in, in high schools, and they are pretty much, there's more every week. And I don't have figures for Canada. But I would say to go, and, and uh, I'll get back to what I'm saying, but I would say to go on top of what I think someone, it doesn't matter, whatever. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you, you had a succinct um, point of advice. I'll give a succinct point of advice. Find your allies, build allegiances. What's happening with these gay straight alliances is you've got gay kids, straight kids, all coming together. And they're realizing that it's not just a gay issue, that this is not something that we uh, as a minority have to fight for. This is something that humanity has to fight for. And this isn't happening in a bunch of political um, leaders who have been active in political office for many, many years. This is happening at the grassroots level in our American, middle American high schools. So you have regular American 15 and 16 year olds who are willingly taking on any homophobia that might come regardless of their sexual orientation. So you have straight girls running these organizations and you have um, you know, people go into these organizations and they don't define their sexuality. It's just, we're here to fight homophobia. And the exciting thing about that is, it's everybody's issue. And all of a sudden, it's not about a big dangerous world. It's about our world, and there's a few idiots over there that are saying hate things. You know, and it, so it totally shifts the way that you see the world. You know, the world is not, oh my god, everyone's out to get me. The world is, we're all together, and you know, there's those crazies. So I think that's one way to look at it. But one of the significant things that I hear you saying is sort of a movement from the individual uh, being isolated to, to actually joining a community. Absolutely. And the community actually can have an impact 
in, in kind of moving us. Ne again. Never underestimate yeah. the power of, you know, of allies, of, of straight defined people, of undefined yeah. people, because a lot of people today don't want to define their sexuality. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you have a, a very large movement of label free people yeah. or people who believe in fluid sexuality, where, where sexuality is something that everyone's bisexual or we're all just something that we can't define. So, you know, yes, exactly, as you said. And let's not forget that this is not just about gay kids. This is all. about all kids on the fringe, all yeah. kids who feel like they're in some way different or perceived to be different. Um, and who doesn't ever have that experience? Right. And hate crimes, more often hate crimes are committed against those perceived to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, right. transgender than those who actually are. So this is, a, this is a, a matter of gathering and identifying a community and friends. But how are you going to do that unless you are who you are? Uh, for everybody, everybody of all ages, all ages. And I imagine the power of religious institutions turning their resources to this. The idea of community, the idea of service. I would challenge progressive uh, religious GLBTQ people to become heroes and examples, to say that part of the reason they fight for youth and rights is because of their spiritual grounding, not in spite of. That would be lovely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, What's the most critical thing GLBTQ communities and their allies need to focus on right now, today, to change society's negative attitudes towards gays in America? A uh, little moment of deja vu, come out. <laughs> uh, yeah, Y'all have to be role models and examples for the rest of the, of the, of the world to see. If, if all we ever think about when we talk about the gay community are like the village people, then we're like, we're lost, we're lost. Uh, you, you have to be role models and show them that your next door neighbor, your best friend, your best friend's children, the people that you work with, uh, your, the, your, your congregation, members of your congregation, that we're everywhere. We're, we're gay we're, and we should all be telling our stories. Um, I think in addition to that being role models thing, a, a good way to change society's negative image of us would be to help ourselves before we worry about what other people think of you. Like if, if you're trying to focus on external people and what they're thinking about you, but you should, if our community would take care of itself a lot more, like not just focus on, I don't know, making sure that people think one way or another, but go out and help the homeless kids in the street and help people who are less fortunate. And if people see you, I mean, I, I guess it sort of ties in with, or, uh, what, what Christianity you're supposed to do, you know, you shouldn't be going around telling people you're a Christian, you should be doing good works and, and they should know that way. So I guess it's, it's along the same lines, you know, go out and, and help people and then people will start seeing that we aren't so bad if we're not letting our own suffer. That was my answer. I mean, the, the, the Gay Straight Alliances, again, are out there not just raising money for Gay Straight Alliance, but they're raising money for breast cancer or they're raising money for uh, literacy organization. So it's not just giving to themselves as, as we have sometimes done in the gay community where we sit in our little bubble and, and whine, you know. Uh, well, no, it's not about that. It's about l looking at, again at the larger human community. And uh, I can just tell a quick snip story from, um, I think it was Winchester, Virginia. We were just there not too long ago on our Dixie trip, and, which was amazing. Um, and and in ways you might not imagine, but um, in, neither here nor there. The, the point is that the, the, the uh, teacher advisor of the Gay Straight Alliance there, uh, I interviewed her on camera, and she was telling me that these kids, she was referring to her Gay Straight Alliance kids, these kids are the most giving, the most generous kids I've ever come across. They are always out there trying to show people how much they care about them. That's all they want to do. They want to give to everybody. All they want to do is just give, 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 give. And, and isn't that amazing? And that's what I think that we can do as a, as a gay community, as gay youth. And, but then again, us sitting here saying it is almost irrelevant because they're already doing it. They're doing it, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're out there right now and they're doing it and it's amazing. Yeah. And, I, and I think that, I don't, I don't know if it's Generation Y. Is this group called Generation Y? I don't even know that. The generation yeah. Y are, you know what? <laughs> are the ones that are really kind of moving forward with this. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, it almost feels like back to the 60s in some ways. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. uh, Chris, Maya? And I would, I would, I guess it's kind of reiterating what everyone said, alliances, is build alliances, build bridges, break the isolation that um, 
on a, on a church or institutional level is to, I think, see the struggle as united to other historic struggles for women's rights, for civil rights, for uh, um, all people. Um, not to water down the, the specificity of GLBTQ issues, but to say that there's something in common that it's about human dignity and it's about not being alone. I think that almost all that we're talking about comes from being alone, from coming from feeling like you're the only one. The story you told about Matt is that I'm alone. The minute we break that, the power, what I would say for me, uh, the spiritual power, that once two or more are gathered, um, something happens. We have about five minutes, and I wondered if there were some final comments or there's some questions that you wanted to throw out to each other mm. that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, or we can actually go back to something. If, uh, no. Mm. I don't have anything off the top of my head. <laughs> no? OK. Let's, uh, this is a good place to stop and um, open up the mics. Uh, there are mics here and up there. Uh, there's some basic ground rules I ask you to respect, which is to approach the mic. Uh, please give us your name and make your questions brief. And as always, a good question is a question that's brief and ends in a question. <laughs> so that's going to be tough for some of you Harvard folks. Uh, but really, try to practice. This is a practice. Try to practice that tonight so that we can get in as many questions as possible. OK? Please. Diego. Hi. My name is Diego Sanchez. Thank you. I do have a question. It's two part and ends in a question and will be quick. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, I went to a forum for youth of color, and the thing that they've raised as it was supposed to be about coming out, the thing that they talked about most was going to church with their parents and hearing the preacher or priest or rabbi say horrible things, feeling that they were talking about them, and then going home and feeling that their parents we're having to feel shame around that. And so I, I would like to hear what you think about, whether you think that occurs, uh, and what you, what you would do about it. And the other part is, in the part, the section you talked about, the people going in and making noise in a community and walking in and giving out flyers, I wonder if you uh, would tell me, all of you, what you think about what, how that creates safety for the people who are left behind, the youth who do come out and are left there, do you think it's important for institutions and people who are coming out and making noise and, and, the, and the other allies to create any level of safety and how would you think that might occur? Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the first part of that question, I would say that, yeah, it, it definitely does occur. I grew up in the Catholic Church and I definitely heard all the time around me reinforce the message that homosexuality was evil and wrong. I heard it at church. I went to a conservative Catholic school. I heard it there. I heard it at home. But like Chris said, churches can, they can, they can do a lot of harm, but they can do a lot of good too. They could be a very, a very good way to, to create change. And I think part of the reason for that is that churches, I think, greatly are a very family-centered institution. I think most people's most people's introduction to religion comes from the home when they're young, comes from their family. And so if your church is reinforcing one message that is intolerant, then it's very likely that your parents who subscribe to that religion will subscribe to what the, the priest is saying. But at the same time, if, if it's the other way around, the churches could be really big vehicles for fostering change and fostering tolerance within families. Um, so I guess it would really just be a question of finding the churches that are welcoming and are going to help rather than damage family relationships. And, and that's not an, always an easy task, especially in isolated areas. Um, for younger children who are not going to have the freedom to not to go to a church that their parents don't go to. Um, but I think one way that um, progressive churches can fight this is, I think what's come down when the more conservative churches have often talked about this issue, they have talked about sort of the that they are the spiritual home, and then when we talk about sexuality, that's the secular world. And I think what more liberal and progressive churches have to say is no, we can all have a conversation about sexuality, and all really need to have a conversation about sexuality. Okay. And so I just want to quickly say, as far as the safety thing, it, for example, let's look at um, Jerry Falwell's school, Liberty University in, in uh, middle of Virginia there. Um, they don't have any safety. If, if you come out as gay, you're out, you know? So, the, 
the actions that some of these kids are taking, the Soul Force group I mentioned, they actually did a, did a sort of a direct action there um, earlier in the summer where they did hand out pamphlets and handed out biblical um, alternative ways of viewing the Bible. And it was, you know, it was a pretty major thing. Jerry Falwell called them all all kinds of awful names. But at mm. the same time, it got some of the student body at Liberty to think about these issues in a different light. They saw these individuals as not just the idea of what gay is, but actual human beings that were just sitting there trying to do something good. And when we were there on campus, we interviewed a couple of kids from Liberty that were actually not totally strictly against it anymore. You know, maybe they, I mean, they obviously were still anti-gay, but they had, they had the ability to sort of cultivate some broader opinions about it, and it was because of the actions that those kids had taken. So maybe somewhere down in the future, not that I have a lot of hope for Jerry Falwell, but maybe somewhere in the future, um, that school would become more safe. And I think the one thing that happens when you have a, uh, a push or an organization come to your community where, for example, the National Coming Out Project, well, the one thing it does do is encourage people to come out and suddenly you realize, oh, I'm not the only one. You're starting to build a community mm -hmm. now and that definitely uh, starts the foundation for a safer environment. Mm -hmm. It would absolutely be more responsible if you made sure there was something already in place, a community center, for example or a supportive church group, or a PFLAG chapter, or something like that. But the very uh, fact that people are now coming out and talking to one another, whether they're gay gay or straight, they're, they're allies and they know who each other are now. And that that's, lays a tremendous foundation for safety. Please. My name's Kathy Kidman. I'm a mid-career MPA student here at the Kennedy School. And Judy, when your son died, I was the executive director for a gay and lesbian bisexual transgender youth organization and uh, we all appreciate your resilience um, you know and I know you know what happened for many of our organizations after his death and how really busy we were um, it's tragic and Maya you are resilience in action so uh, thank you um, There's a, a program um, in Maine that I wanted to just mention, and then I do have a quick question, which is um, through the, assist, the Attorney General's office. Uh, and gay straight alliances are wonderful, um, but they're not enough. And the, uh, in Maine, there are in 220 schools, there are civil rights teams that are hate violence prevention groups uh, formed by the Attorney General's office to, fund, to, to do exactly the work that you're talking about. And if we could replicate that across the country, um, I just think about how safe all our young people would be. Um, the question I have for you is, the Catholic Church issue of um, going after gay priests is a direct fallout from the sexual abuse scandal. And we live in a country, and I think this is a big failing of our civil rights movement. We live in a country in which one in five to one in seven young men are sexually abused by someone of the same gender. And we don't talk about what that definition is. We don't break the silence about what sexual abuse is. And so we also live in a country that doesn't break the silence about what is healthy homosexuality. Some people think it's an oxymoron. Healthy homosexuality. So what happens for one in seven or one in five uh, men is that it looks like the same thing. So when people are saying, I don't like gay people, you know, keep that, and I'm gonna use this language, keep that faggot away from me, they're not saying, I don't think that person deserves civil rights. They're saying, keep that person away from me. It's about safety. So when we don't lean in and directly address uh, fears about sexual abuse and pedophilia, we let the myth of the male pedophile continue. And I, I guess I want to ask how you as activists and counselors and see our movement as leaning into this, because if we don't, we are not going to be free. And neither will the people who think that they're gay because they were sexually abused be free. Thank you. I'll just quickly say that I think one thing that you're seeing right now is the is the, the task force, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force director Matt Foreman is, has come out with a very public action statement to the effect of what you just said. You know, so it's it's a, I think in ways of not backing down, not not just taking all this as victims, but you know, really 
putting the onus on the people who are doing the wrong thing. And I think so Matt's, Matt's statement, I don't remember it word for word, but it was something you know, to the effect of why are we demonizing, and we were talking about this beforehand, why are we demonizing um, homosexuality within the, from the Vatican when the real issue is you know the pedophilia and the priests. So that you know that when this comes from the the main like uh, gay rights organizations in the U.S., then we can you know have a strong stance on it, and that's a good way to start it off. I don't really know the rest of it. For one thing, I want to say just somewhat related to that is to really separate a lot of when I'm talking about what I think of as the terrible things that some religious groups are doing, I'm really talking about the institutional church because I think there are some fine people in conservative denominations doing wonderful things for people. So when we say Catholic, I'm, I'm really referring to these institutional things like you know, what's this sort of, what I would call a witch hunt um, and, and a clear scapegoating. I mean, I don't even think it's a metaphor. I mean, it is, we don't want to deal with how a culture was created that um, in fact fostered pedophilia, let's, homosexuals, there, there's a good thing. If we can talk about that and then we can channel all that energy because there's already some, it's literally using homophobia to avoid dealing with an issue. And That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. in my own personal value system, I'm gonna say that now, is evil and sinful to, to actually use a group of people as a way of not dealing with your own problems. Well, I, and I think the role of the media is huge here as well. Uh, I didn't even know Matt had issued a statement, and, and I should know that. Mm, yeah. And it's not been in the papers, it's not, been, uh, it's not been out, or we would all know about it. If the media doesn't share this information with us, if they don't publish these statements, if they continue to make the, uh, the connection between the homosexual community and uh, the priest issue in the Catholic Church, then nobody's going to separate the two. Yeah. Uh, the role of the media is huge here. Mm -hmm. And we have, to, to, uh, we have to also do our best to continue to portray positive stories of ourselves. Yes. Because obviously what's the perception, perception of homosexuality? It's going to be what people see. And do we all look like the guys on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? I'm not sure that we do. Uh, but that's pretty much what they think. So, um, you know, you know. we... we <laughs> Words there come out. Exactly. I was just going to, I was actually going back to what you were just saying. We, we, we all don't look like the guys on Queer Eye, and we all are not white. So exactly. That's, that's yes. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, amen. Exactly. Amen. 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 Please. Uh, good evening. My name is Lisa George, and I'm a second year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and we've been hearing a lot about poverty in America and how America sort of not, hasn't been paying attention to poverty issues in this country. And I was wondering, what is, what is the movement, the JLBTQ movement, doing differently? Or does it have to do anything differently in the poorest communities in this country? What happens when there are differences in class? Um, and I'm just curious about that. Thank you. Good question. Well, basic, basic civil rights are denied to the gay community regardless of, of wealth, class, race, religion, whatever. Uh, tax code benefits, marriage, adoption, uh, loan, housing, all those things denied to the gay community. And it makes it even more uh, apparent when poverty is involved. Let's go to the Katrina issue, just yes. briefly. Um, uh, Same-sex families, uh, gay families with children uh, who cannot get family benefits because they're not really families. Okay, this is tragic. This is tragic. They really are families. But legally, they are not and not eligible for a lot of the benefits. And uh, this only adds to the, to, the, um, to the desperate need of people, regardless of the class. But certainly, poverty emphasizes all of that, all of that. I think this also ties back to what we were talking about earlier and how if we as a community just did more to help people, all people, regardless of class or anything else, um, it would help overall people's perception of us. And I know with this, with this Katrina issue, um, after, after the hurricane, the organization, the National Youth Advocacy Coalition that I'm on the board of helped organize a, a relief fund specifically for the LGBTQ families and youth that had been hit by it because they were being left out of the other relief efforts. So it's things like that that as a community we need to get organized and, and help with. That's, that's pretty significant because in, in the New Orleans area, uh, about 25% of uh, the folks that were below the poverty line are African-American 
and a significant uh, percentage of those folks are also GLBTQ. So you're talking about a double whammy in a sense. But Chris? Well, and I think that, um, talk, going back to the media, that they're really, really the, the, when good images of GLBTQ people have been put forth in the media, they have been overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white, and overwhelmingly affluent. Mm -hmm. And that is not anywhere near what the community is. Um, and, you know, there are some interesting figures, you know, like among street kids and homeless youth, that the proportion of GLBTQ among that is much higher than you would simply imagine if it were to be a random sample. So all of these oppressions are so interlocked, um, and we have to be aware of putting one against the other. So, you know, um, with this image of white gay men all of a sudden sort of gaining a certain kind of fashion or um, a certain kind of, uh, they're cool, they're in, um, why don't we take that power and use it to do some good for the people that aren't? And it's about what are, the, what, are, what are the priorities that we take on as organizations that are supposedly reaching out to queer people all across America. Are the priorities, is the priority those priorities that the 30 to 40 year old white affluent men want for themselves or is it the priorities that really the people who are out there across America want and how do we understand what their priorities are if we don't really get a sense of what their feelings are, and how do we get a sense of what their feelings are if all we do is sit in our little, you know, bubbles and, and talk about it? And um, I wanted to talk about the homeless thing as well. It's 30 to 40 percent is the figure. 30 to 40 percent of the young people on the streets identify as queer, and that's that's a fact. That's really that's disgusting. I mean, when you think about the fact that that I mean, look at the regular population. But there, but in, in New York City, the, sorry, the only the only resource for for youth on the street is Covenant House, and Covenant House is run by the Catholic Church. And, and you know, I know you very you know very very close to your heart this issue. That there is now the Ali Fournier Center. The Ali Fournier Center, I believe, has a hundred beds. This is the only center in New York City that is safe for anybody who identifies as queer. And these kids. Great, again, 30 to 40 percent of all the homeless kids. So that's on any given night, six to seven thousand young people in New York City looking for beds, and they have a waiting list six to nine months long for these 100 beds in the Ali Fournier Center. And what are we doing as a gay community to do anything about this? Are we that's listening right. to Maya when she talks in her speeches and says there's homeless youth out there, and our community needs to reach out to them? I mean, are we listening? Well, there's the issue of stereotypes. You know, you have uh, many same-sex couples who would love to take these, uh, these kids into their homes, but do they? No, because they're afraid of the stereotypes. Um, or they're not allowed to because of the stereotypes. What stereotypes are you talking about? Oh, uh, gay men and young gay men. You know, it's the stereotype of the, it's all about the sex, and it really isn't. It's about caring for, their, for the young people. Um, also, why are they homeless? Well. Where are they going to go? Their parents don't want them. Their families don't want them. They, they, are, uh, they are discarded. And why? Well, because someone's been telling them that their children are now unworthy. Well, who is that someone? Well, it's society at large or the institutionalized church. It's our fault that they're out there. And what are we doing for them? They're largely invisible because we don't know what to do with them. We don't know what to do with them. Um, it's hard to get them into foster care or they go into group homes. It's worse for them there than it is to be on the street. The street is safer than foster care uh, and group homes. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy and one really without an overall solution other than members of the community and allies getting involved and taking a stance. And that would include churches doing something for kids, not just their middle-aged patrons, but their kids as well. I was going to say, the, the law is also are just totally geared against people who are trying to do something to help. Because I know, for example, in Chicago, there's something like 25 or 50 beds specifically for youth in homeless shelters, and that's all. Like, of all the, of all the youth out there on the streets, there's 50 at the most beds on any given night that they can, that they can go to and be safe because the shelters for adults are, are more dangerous than the streets are. I, I don't know any kids who would go to them unless it's so cold that you would freeze to death if you didn't. And, um, and even then you might not want to. But, and, and out of all of those beds, there's not a single one specifically for GLBTQ youth. And the laws are written so that even these shelters that are set up for the youth specifically can't keep them for, I think it's 
it's under a month that is the period that they're allowed to shelter them for if they're under 18. So basically, you've got all these kids who are homeless who aren't, aren't 18 yet, and the shelters can get in trouble for sheltering them, uh, according to the law. It's just, it's so structured to keep kids on the streets and keep kids away from the people who are trying to do something to help. And one way people can, if, if, if someone feels like they really are passionate about this, hearing what we're saying here, one way people can do something is Congress passed a law in the mid-70s that allowed youth-specific shelters to be created. Now, that law, if you read through all the text, never mentions anything about anybody being other than straight. Okay, so what we need to do clearly is we need to go to Congress and we need to get that law and we need to rewrite that and we need to include this reality of the 30 to 40%. So how do we do that? Well, we have to lobby Congress. And how do we do that? Well, we need to use the HRC and other gay organizations to do that. So that's one way to think about it. Please. Um, we've been talking a lot, or you guys were talking a lot about coming out as being really, really important. And I, I totally agree with that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really vocally out. Um, but since I came out and have been on the leadership of some queer organizations at my school, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people in the community that are closeted, that are my age, and that are thinking about coming out. Um, and I guess one issue that I kind of deal with when they're talking to me about this is, how do you advise someone my age, which I'm 19, um, about coming out if they are not sure that their family will accept them, and if they're not sure that their family will continue to financially support them through school? Um, and like, how do we deal with that? Because it, it's dangerous to come out and that's why we should all be coming out to like reduce the danger. But for some people it's so dangerous that they will lose so much um, as a lot of us know. So I'm just wondering like, what's your advice for like how to talk to people who don't think their families will support them? Do you wanna take well, a that people ask me this question a lot since I, I did come out and my family did reject me and I ended up on the streets and I've been out of college for three years now, attempting to still get to Brown, which I'm not sure I'll ever do because I, I don't have the financial support I, I once did. Um, and it really is hard. I don't have any blanket advice that you can just give to every youth in that situation because you don't know people's individual situations. And there are cases where, I mean, I, I would love it if every gay youth in the country could just come out right now and, and that would be fine. But there are so many people who will end up, end up in situations like mine. And it's hard to say, is, is it, is it a, a good trade-off, like your entire life and financial security and all of that for the freedom and, and the, the courage and the, the I don't know, the, the being a role model for other people who are in that situation. Um, so I don't think that there really is something that you can just say to everyone. It's got to be an, an individual decision of whether you are at that point in life where it would be safe for you. Are, are you going to have somewhere to go if your family does reject you? Are you or are you going to end up on the streets? Um, so I think each person has to sort of analyze their situation themselves and, and see if, it, if it's safe, if it's just physically going to be possible. I would just, oh, sorry. So I was just going to say, say that I would combine a healthy dose of the ideal, which is everyone needs to come out, with the healthy dose of your own ability to understand your circumstance. And I think one thing that we always tell people is, you know, this is your decision. It's no one else's decision. It's not the community's decision. It doesn't make you a bad or good lesbian or, or gay man to, to, to wait or, you know, whatever. This is your lo life, and you make the decision when you are comfortable to make that decision. And it exercises much intelligence and care during that decision. It's, it's all very, it's all very personal and individual. And and unless you're ready and fully confident to be who you are, it's, it's not, in my opinion, it's not time. It's not time. And coming out isn't one thing. It isn't, I mean, this kind of a romanticized version. You come out, so now everyone knows you're gay. And I think if you talk to anybody um, who's been through this experience, there are numerous ways that you come out over time. And I think one of the things for youth is to try in small ways to make alliances, to find other people to talk to. I mean, people are talking to you. That's wonderful. Um, I've just begun um, volunteering uh, for the GLBT helpline at Fenway Community Health, and they have something called the peer line um, that you can call and anonymously talk to someone um, and just have a conversation. And that can be so liberating for some people to just have somebody hear the words and, and have um, just be able for someone to know in some way, even if it's anonymous. Thank you. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
My name's Carrie Farrell. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a social worker, and I teach uh, down the street at a much smaller school than this one. Um, and I teach adults how to be uh, adjustment counselors, guidance counselors, and teachers. And um, there's two tracks to this, and I'll try to be brief. I'm not from Harvard. Um, one is... I'm an old fag who came out when I was a teenager and lived on the streets. And uh, when I look around the room, I feel even older. Uh, but when I look at Maya Keys, I feel empowered. And I feel hopeful about the future uh, for all kids. And um, I guess in terms of some of the stuff that's been brought up since I've been standing so long, <laughs> I had to respond to a couple things. One is, I've always taken in gay kids into my house. Fuck those other people. I mean, I really feel, oh, I really feel, sorry, sorry. I'm a professional, I for, forgive me, please. Um, I really feel that it's our duty to take in younger people. If we had the room, if all these people can take in these thousands of people that got driven out of, uh, by a natural disaster out of the poorest part of the country can take them into their homes and make room for them. Why can't we make room for, our, why do we need shelters for LGBT youth? Why can't we take them in? And I have lived my whole life in fear. You never stop being afraid, it's what you do about it. The other thing I want to talk about is schools. We, you guys talked about churches, I want to talk about schools. We know the half of half of all kids in school admit to being bullied in school for one reason or another. And I would like to talk about and have you maybe suggest some ideas about the idea of zero tolerance for bullying, violence, um, um, uh, being tolerant of differences. Because there's a whole lot of kids that get marginalized for a lot of different reasons. I think uh, we are like the canary in the coal mine. You know, we, we're the most obvious examples of people who get driven into depression and anxiety and out of their homes. And, and we haven't talked yet about all the kids who drop out of school, who never become a statistic in school because they never get recorded as anything. And I'd like to hear some about how we can create these, not just, I think the GL, you know, the gay straight stuff, the alliances. Yeah. Is, is wonderful, I'm glad to hear there's 3,800 and they're growing by the week and everything else. But in terms of the whole schools, how do we create schools that are, are, are not, where half of the kids in every school, and most of the people I teach are urban school teachers, half of the kids in every school get up with knots in their stomach about going to school because they don't know where the attack is gonna come from or what it's gonna be like, if it's gonna be verbal or physical or something, so. Thank you. That's well, I think that you should start young with a, a no tolerance policy for, for bullying, for that kind of thing. I don't know how many people were noticed when this happened, but a, a while ago, a little while ago, there was this project called the No Name Calling Week that was geared towards elementary schools, really, and it was, it was basically getting kids to stop bullying each other just across the board. And if you went to the website for the No Name Calling Week, it was pretty straightforward, like kids stop picking on each other. There was not a single mention anywhere on it of any GLBT issues or any specific names that people might be calling each other. It was basically just stop being nasty to each other all the time. And then on, I think Glisten was maybe one of the partners. There was, I don't know, 25 different organizations that had signed on for this. But then all these people like, uh, James Dobson and stuff, were campaigning so hard against No Name Calling Week because they thought that it was some devious homosexual ploy to like sensitize their kids and, and make them tolerant of homosexuality. And I just thought it was so funny that it was, it was a very straightforward project just to try to get all kids everywhere to stop being nasty to each other for one week. And they, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand it. They were like, and, and really, how do you defend something like that? How do you stand there and say, no, I think that my, my six-year-old should be bullying other six-year-olds? Um, kindness, kindness is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to respond to that? Well, question? one of the issues is that bullies have issues or they wouldn't be bullies. And if we don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't think zero tolerance really works if we don't address the issues that 
that the bullies are facing. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why they're bullies. One being maybe they're bullied at home and this is the, how they're acting out. Or they are so desperate to not become bullied themselves at school, they themselves become the bullies. There are reasons why they are bullies. And it's just as important to address those issues as it is to stop them from doing it. And by the way, if you're a bystander, you're part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Suzanne Rotundo. I'm also a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, the bystander comment just grabbed my attention and made me want to ask this in a different way. But um, I think some of us are feeling like bystanders or colluders right now because here at Harvard we're facing a, a situation where there's been a policy at the law school that the military can't recruit here because of its uh, discrimination against lesbians and gays in the military. And the university has recently decided to renege on that and basically break its own policy and allow the military to recruit here um, and overlook that discrimina discrimination policy in the military. We talked about the role of churches and what, ch what churches can do to be part of the solution. I'm curious about what you think the role of big institutions and educational institutions need to be in s major civil rights movements. This is arguably the biggest civil rights movement of this decade. What, what is the role of a, an institution like Harvard or the other institutions around here in playing a role to move this forward? I mean, I, th I think especially in the America we live in, where big institutions do everything for us, more than I think we even are aware of, if we don't challenge those institutions to make changes, then change becomes so much more difficult. Um, so I, I wasn't aware of this happening at Harvard, and it makes me very sad. Um, I know there's been similar tensions around Boy Scouting groups um, with churches, actually, because churches, uh, progressive churches have often been the hosts for Boy Scout groups. And now, because of their civil rights commitments, they are saying no. And then some of the parishioners are, are, are really objecting to that. And um, you know, th there are some interesting scouting organizations now springing up as alternatives that are a little more open. So I think big institutions have to be involved in, um, in a way, in our contemporary society, they, they are entities, they are people, and they need to be as accountable as individual people are, if not more, because of the power that they wield. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna move us on, along a little bit. We've got about uh, seven or eight minutes. Please. Hi, my name is uh, Tomas Amorim. I'm an openly uh, gay staff member uh, here at Harvard. Um, I'm a bit uncomfortable about asking this question, but I feel I, feel I need to. I'd like the panelists to, to discuss something that I've already touched a bit, but is, we, we're, we're talking about us versus them, but, but can we talk a little bit more about how welcoming and healthy of a gay community are we sometimes to being young and gay in America? I volunteered with some gay youth, and, and you often hear um, complaints and frustrations about how cutthroat the gay community can be, um, how bitchy, um, the focus on um, drugs, the focus on alcohol, and let's face it, the focus on sex. I mean, there is some truth, unfortunately, behind those stereotypes that we've touched on. So how do we address that so we really make it safe for gay youth to come out? Okay. Mike, Thank you. I'll start. answer that. Uh, I've, I've been to 43 of the 50 states, and I've interviewed almost 1,000 people, and if I pretty much took a cross-section of all the people I've met that are between the ages of 15 and 25, 27, I bet you 99.9% .9 of them would say that if you put the gay community in quotes, that they don't agree with it. That the gay community doesn't care about us. The gay community doesn't like us. The gay community is irrelevant. The gay community is stupid. The gay community is only after their own issues. Um, and I think that perception comes from exactly what you're talking about, which is that the gay community is this monolithic force that is only interested in raising tons of money for marriage and all these other issues and doesn't pay attention. Now, how do, we, how do we listen? I mean, that's the age-old question. Um, one of the ways in which that we've been trying to do is you know, tell the stories and make a media forum for the people who aren't part of that monolithic force. So if I'm down in Mississippi talking to two anarchists by girls that you know, want to really, like, what they want to do is that Queer Fist organization. I don't know if you folks have heard of that, but it's a very radical organization. 
I know you've heard. Um, it, and, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's obviously going to be like the institutions that are important that are the mainstream, and then there's going to be the, all the, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, and those are these anarchist organizations, for example. So we need to continue to seek, as the mainstream organizations, continue to seek out the voices of the non-mainstream and realize that we can never for a second rest on what we think is what, is what defines gay. I mean, gay, what is it anymore? It's so different than it ever has been. It's not the same thing that it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, if, 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 if you're someone who defines himself as gay and you're 35 and you're 40, you don't get it, I'm sorry. You don't get it, and, I, and I'm 30, I don't get it. Because the, the fact is that, that your experience of, of coming out and even, even being out in high school is totally different. For me, I, I graduated high school in 1993, not even, not even a, I could never have been out of my high school, and there was no internet, and there was no Matthew Shepard, uh, Matthew Shepard's death. And I'm sorry to bring it up as a, as, a, as a factoid as opposed to a personal experience, but Matthew Shepard's death in 1998, and the internet, it was right, in 98, right? Sorry, if it wasn't, <laughs> that would be horrible. Um, and, and the internet, in, uh, coming around at the end of the 90s, totally radically changed the notion of what it means to be gay for every single young person across America, because for me, being gay meant I'm totally different, I'm totally isolated, I'm totally abnormal, I've got to run away to the gay ghetto so that I can meet a real life gay person, so that I can find a book, so that I can get a magazine, whatever. Uh, other than that, all I have is weird conjectures and feelings that gay is all this crazy gross stuff. But nowadays, if you're 15, you can go online and you can get access to information anonymously and you can come out or not come out, but there's a gay straight alliance in your school, or there's kids talking about it, or for the most part, if you come out at 15, like in most American high schools, you're, you're gonna find some straight friends. You're gonna be accepted. So gay doesn't mean all the things it meant 20 years ago. That's something that the people who are in power of the gay community need to start realizing because the gay that they might be fighting for might be completely irrelevant to the gay that exists for 70% of the gay people out there. So how do they do that? Well, they got to open their eyes a little bit more. So it's, just, it's true. Please. Hi, my name is Colby Berger, and I work for the Home for Little Wanderers. Um, and I know many of you in the room know about Waltham House when we're talking about resources for queer youth, uh, especially for queer homeless youth and youth who are involved in the juvenile justice, foster care systems, and the child welfare system. Um, Waltham House is a unique program in that it was one of three programs in the nation when it opened three years ago that serves GLBTQ youth um, who are living in a group home setting. When we talk about allocating resources, when we talk about getting involved, this is a place where you all can get involved, be mentors, give your time, give your energy, and start talking about the kids who are left behind. We know that there are disproportionate numbers of GLBTQ kids, and we haven't talked as much about the BT and Q kids, but I want to make sure that we do, um, as they are represented in child welfare and juvenile justice. So I'd like to pose the question to you all, how do you think we can light the fire under mainstream organizations who are involved in child welfare, who are involved in juvenile justice, who are involved in foster care and adoption, um, and bring together the queer communities to talk about these issues? Well, in, 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 the, in the few years that I have been doing this, and homeless, homeless kids has been one of the things that I've really been working on, uh, that I'm most interested in. Um, we did a documentary about homeless youth and, and discovered these horrible statistics and being on the street and how they, th these kids totally lose trust and, and become somebody different after they've been out. But one of the most disturbing things we found is that uh, community centers and residences for these kids do not talk to each other. No one has mentioned green chimneys in New York while they do residences too. It's like, it's, it's like a big secret everywhere. Y'all should be organizing with each other to find out what works and what doesn't. And work with the glass in LA and, and places that are huge that, that have um, success records. And there should just be an organization where y'all can share problems and solutions as well. Well, wouldn't that be nice? But the problem is everybody's so concerned with, and I agree with you 110,000%, everybody's so concerned with holding on to what makes their organization so important that they want to proprietorize all the information. They don't tell each other anything. We were trying to, we put together the XY Survival Guide, which is a resource uh, book um, back in 2000. And at the time, we were, I won't, I won't demonize anybody, but we were trying to work with one of the national organizations. We asked them for a list of some of the resources and they wouldn't give it to us. You know, it's just the type of things, why don't we do that to each other? What, who are they, I mean, who are they trying to, you know,
you know, we're, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. And it's I'm not sorry. just resources that they're protecting, <laughs> but it's their money. You know, they're all worried about, well, if, you, if I talk to you, then you might get my money. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, on. that's what the bottom line is, because yeah. they're afraid about the funding money. There's, money, there's so. more than the limited amount of pockets who want to give to this if we all talk about it. But we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it enough. We don't encourage each other enough. We don't make the problem widely known enough. The press doesn't work with us. The national aid organizations don't work with us. They're concentrating on something else, and we don't talk to each other. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. And, and definitely has a solution. But until we work together and present a united front, things just aren't going to get done. We have to pay more attention and to the, and the way the right wing does. we don't keep the focus on kids. That's right. We don't keep the focus on kids. We let ourselves get sidetracked. That's right. I just want to mention that the right is actually focusing on kids and That's coming just, up um, yeah. in the next couple of months, actually, for folks who don't know. In October and December, there are two hugely right wing conferences coming to Boston. Um, the first one is the last weekend in October. It's called Love One Out, mm -hmm. um, and it's about mm -hmm. ex-gay reparative therapy. Um, we need to be able to organize around these conferences, and efforts are underway now, but if you're looking for ways to get involved, please contact your allied organizations. Do something with your religious institutions. The second one is coming in December, and it's about how to get the homosexual agenda out of your schools. Again, this is hugely dangerous. There are times right now when you need to be getting involved, yesterday when you need to be getting involved. So please talk to folks in your schools, talk to parents who are on board, um, child welfare organizations, schools. We need folks to stand up and say this is not okay and it's not gonna happen in Boston. Thank you. The Back up a little bit, Maya. I would just say I think that the issue of communication and different groups being able to work with each other and create partnerships and having more sort of cooperation between all the different groups that are out there. This is one area where I think that most mainstream groups, as weird as it might sound to you all who are not anarchists, could take a big tip from how the radical <laughs> activist community is organized. And yes, I am saying organized anarchists. Um, because really, you go to a, a protest or an action and we're, we're sitting around washing dishes for food not bombs in the kitchen and activists from the East Coast who have never been away from the East Coast know what's going on on the West Coast. Know the, you mention a name of some random person who lives out in Oregon and they're like, oh yeah, I know, I know this person who lives in California, do you know them? And they're like, yeah, of course I know them, I've worked with them on this, this and this. And it's, it's not a question of, of somebody intruding on somebody else's turf. It's you, you work together and you get a lot more done. Thank you. Please. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello, my name is Travis Wright, and I have a shout out, a thank you, and a heartfelt question. Uh, the shout out is to Maya, who is a point scholar like me. Um, and I, I know a lot we've talked about tonight things, resources that aren't available, but I want to let the young people in the room know that there is an organization that helps. I was also sort of disowned by my family after I came out. Um, and the Point Foundation actually helps pay for GLBT young people to go to college. So if you're here tonight and you don't know where to go for help, go to the Point Foundation and they can help. The second thing I want to say is something I promised myself I would do a long time ago if I ever had the chance, and this is to Ms. Shepard. I came out um, the day that Matthew Shepard died um, as a public school, t as, a, as a high school teacher in Estes Park, Colorado. And... <laughs> And then, and the next day, I was outed to my family, and was disowned for a time. And as you stood up and so proudly claimed your son, I felt like you were also claiming me. And your goodness and the gift that you gave to the world meant the world to me. And at a time in my life when I really needed it, it meant a lot to have a mother saying that she still loved me. And because of your example, I've been able to do a lot of work with my own family, and I feel like now we really are becoming a family once again. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And my question for you is, I have been so inspired by your goodness then and since then. When you went to the court and pleaded for the murder of your son's freedom, I was, I was inspired and called to be a better person. And so my question for you is, how do you sustain such hope? How do you sustain such goodness? 
as a gay man in Boston who wants to get married in June, <laughs> I still every day as I read the paper watch people fighting about my right to be in the world. And some days it's just not easy to feel good about it. Yeah. How do you sustain question. such hope? Thank goodness. <laughs> um, well, I know this is going to sound pretty simplistic to all of you, but uh, the truth of the matter is we all made a conscious decision to not go down the road of anger and hate, knowing that it isn't what Matt would want, nor could we uh, help anybody else from that dark place. Um, I know it sounds like, how could you just decide something like that? Well, you can just decide something like that. You can. Uh, taking the death penalty off the table, we knew personally that it becomes different it becomes different when it's a personal issue. Uh, and we knew that it isn't something that the message that Matt would have wanted to communicate. He was a big believer in the reconciliation uh, situation that was going on in South Africa that, that they set up. He thought that was a brilliant idea. Um, so we did it for him and we did it for his community. One more act of violence was not gonna change anything. Uh, it, was, it, it was gonna send the wrong kind of message. And quite frankly, you give me far too much credit because Part of the removing the death penalty was that he would no longer speak to the press. Well, that sort of happened anyway, but we're hoping it won't happen again. Uh, and for us, it just sort of made it over. We could move on really knowing that he wasn't going to be in court forever and ever and ever. And honestly, how merciful was that? He's serving two consecutive life sentences. He will never see the light of day. So it's, it's taking one punishment over another. Uh, but for us, it basically made the situation just done, um, which is really what we wanted, was for it to be done. Thank you. Thanks Thank for your you. question and your kind words. We're running out of time. We have time for just a few more questions, please. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Healy. I go to St. John's Prep, which is a high school in uh, Danvers, Massachusetts. That's all guys. And uh, I'm here with ABS, which is our Gay Straight Alliance. and. Uh, we, the information for this open forum was presented to us by our moderator, Mr. Malaro. Uh, I volunteered to go over the intercom and read it, and the moment I did, I felt scared of just reading it and uh, hearing the reactions of kids in the hallway. And after I read it, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't meted with the same, or greeted with the same reactions that I expected. Most of them were, you know, hey Healy, great job, you know, uh, right on, we appreciate what you did. And those were from kids that I thought, you know, would have reacted much differently and hatefully. And when they did that, I realized, you know, it's not that they hate or despise the gay community. It's that they fear us because they don't understand us. They don't understand, you know, anything that the gay community has to go through. They don't understand the feelings. And have you ever came across anyone at a protest or, you know, holding a sign and looked at them and, you know, just seen that they don't hate what you are what you know the gay community or alliances of gay community are they just don't understand and fear because they don't understand oh yeah I, I think ignorance is the root of it all however I think I would take issue with the hate part I do think that there are extreme groups that really hate that really hate us um, and the reasons that they hate us this is going to be sort of a you know, a dichotomy. The reason that they hate us is because they don't know us. But they don't feel any kindness towards us either. Um, and, and, and there is one group in particular that it comes to mind. It was one that Mike mentioned earlier. They, they show no compassion for anyone who is the least bit different than them. Uh, maybe based on ignorance or fear, I, I'm not sure. But I would definitely define what they feel as hate. And I don't for a minute think that they would ever uh, retract a, a, you know, a hateful statement that they say. They say the most unkind and outrageous things about the most innocuous situations based on hate they feel. I mean, they think Dolly Parton is a gay enabler and they protest her. <laughs> you know, I, I know I think that I think that re, I think that re, I think that requires a certain element of at the very least dislike. <laughs> um, so I, I would take issue with the hate part, but I I think that they're absolutely the minority. And I think that the people who, who say things against us, you are absolutely right. They say them because they don't know. And how are we going to educate them? Well, we have to tell our stories. 
and we have to talk, and we have to be out. And I commend you for your courage. Thank you. Please. Good evening. I'm Shantanette Patrice. Um, I actually um, want to say thank you for the energy of the panel members, but my question sort of comes on the tail end of Cor Kobe's um, announcement of Waltham House, which was open um, in this area, and I was the director at the time, and I was a part of that wonderful experience. The, the problem with an experience like that is it leaves you wanting more. And I hear a lot of people talking tonight about how to get kids off the streets and into their homes. And we forget that sometimes when we get acculturated a particular way, that somehow going back um, to the picket fence and the two dogs and mom and mom and dad and dad just isn't enough. And so, because I, I see you guys as my sheroes and heroes and how you stepped out on faith, I'm trying to figure out how do I then, instead of having a Waltham House, which is governed by a lot of politics with DSS. Um, how do we build a house or a home for the kids in our community that may house more than 12? Like, I'm not sure how to start that, but I'm willing to step out of the clinical 50 minute hour and uh, do that, but I'm not sure how to start it. So, my question I is. Wish I, I wish I knew how to start, <laughs> uh, start a house. I mean, We should find that out. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, no. I'll one of the problems. That was, I, was just I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, but every yeah. state, every county, every city has its own legal restrictions. Number one, that's one of our major problems. Another one is young people who are kicked out from their homes, who are underage, well, they can't work, right? But they need parental signature to go somewhere else because they're not emancipated. Well, how's that going to work? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's going to take a massive, a massive rework. One of my dreams when I started the Matthew Shepard Foundation was to provide a series of residences not as, a, not as a rescue from the streets, but as an alternative to the streets, to get them to come there first, to provide a place where they could go for a continuing education, where they could stay for more than 30 days, uh, get work, job training, skills counseling, whatever. But the logistics of getting that done is a nightmare. It's a nightmare because everywhere it's different. Everywhere it's different. And the, and the pushback you get from your community, not in my backyard, is huge. One thing I would say is, oh, did I interrupt? Uh, one thing I would say is, is that don't underestimate the skills that you may have built up already. Um, and maybe, this, maybe that's not specifically referring to how to start a house, but maybe it's referring to something else that is equally valuable, but doesn't, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, like, for example, I know the, folk, the guy who started the Ali Fournier Center that I spoke of earlier in New York, he had experience working at Covenant House already for, for 10, 15 years, and he was also a social worker. So those two skill bases he was able to bring together. He knew how to deal with all the bureaucracy. He knew how to deal with all that stuff so that he could then go and start this groundbreaking house. But maybe there's things that you've done in your experiences that you know and, and that you can then take to an initiative that's your own, and then you can find allies in doing that same sort of thing. I just, I just think that there's probably, undoubtedly, a thousand billion wonderful things that you know already that you could bring to something amazing. And then my second part of the question is, if I build it, will you come back? I didn't hear it. That's a challenge. My challenge is, if I build it, will you come back? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name, hi, my name is Rocco Pignari. I have a question for all of you. We, we can't um, hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is... R Great. <laughs> we my, can name, know. my name is Rocco Pignari. I have a question for all of you. I noticed through a lot of your talking there seems to be an attitude of sort of us versus them um, in terms of all four of yours actions. Um, and I realized that um, both you, Ms. Keys, and Mr. Medeiros talked about a little bit about sort of the we, sort of how um, GLBT society fits in with the rest of society and how it's not just an action against us, but also an action that possibly has consequences for other parts of society. And I'm curious um, if you feel that this is, I, I'm curious as to why um, there seems to be much more of this us for, I'm sorry. I'm curious as to if you feel that this sort of we idea is something that will become more popular in the future or is possibly a, a, um, a method of social change. And this is a question for all four of you. 
I mean, in terms of churches, I think it's where we have to go. It's where, um, when we're making decisions, churches are um, groups that are supposed to welcome anyone. So when we have discussions about certain issues, there has to be a weeness. And even churches that um, had sort of become singular, I'm thinking about the Metropolitan Community Church, which was founded really as a GLBT church, is getting increasing numbers of straight people for a whole variety of reasons, which I find fascinating. But I also think as more uh, churches are getting more liberal, people are actually coming back to them who had left. So now you're getting communities that are diverse and are having to have a discussion within that diversity. I think if you don't, if you have less players at the table, you, you don't do a good job at what you have to do. If you don't have many voices, then nothing happens. Uh, and, and I will just throw in my two cents there, and I know I'm beginning to sound like a broken record, but y'all have to tell your stories. <laughs> y'all have to talk. And straight allies, such as myself, the gay community, you need me. You need my demographic to get everything done, everything done, whether it's legislation or education or grassroots movements and bringing people into the churches and educating all of them, but it requires y'all's parents and your siblings and the, and the straight allies to make a stand. Uh, and that would be we. And as more and more people come out and their friends and families uh, come out as well, because that's also required, not just for the members of the community, but for their families and their loved ones to talk about the situations that their children and loved ones face, then it does become we. And I do think that that's the road to success. We have time for just one or two more questions, and then we're going to have to close. Good evening, my name is um, James Battaglia, and um, I'm, I actually uh, have a, even though we're the same age, Mike, um, uh, my experience was different. I came out at 15 in high school and in this area and uh, was, uh, was beaten pretty badly and at times gotten into some compromising situations and, and did turn to drugs and alcohol to relieve some of that situation. And um, for me, over the years, uh, you know, and worked with the Governor's Commission in 93 to help pass the, the first student rights bill here in Massachusetts to protect gay youth in, in here in Massachusetts and so that they could attend schools and not be harassed and protected for, for who they were. Um, and one of the things for me within the gay community, where we've heard a lot tonight about um, coming out, we've heard a lot about um, you know being allies, and, but for me, uh, coming back as being a youth Coming back, um, I'm sorry, as an adult into the gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, questioning queer youth community, um, as an adult gay ally um, has been so empowering for myself. Um, and Mike, you've traveled across the U.S. Meyer coming out as a young person. And um, you, what are some of the things that you've seen, heard um, from other youth, uh, queer youth, who uh, would like or and or, um, you know, how can I answer, ask this question, uh, would like and or would like to receive from other gay folks in, the commu in their community? Because we hear a lot about the stereotypes of, you know, what a gay male is, what a lesbian is, what we look like, what we do, where we spend our money, all that stuff. Um, but as one person who um, is still considered young in some way, shape, or form, um, you know, has come out the other end as a sober woman, as a lesbian woman, works for a church, helps run a homeless shelter here in Harvard Square. I want to be someone who can be a role model for other gay youth. Um, and I'd like to hear more about what that can be. Uh, I want to be a positive role model for gay youth here. Um, well, I think that as a, a lesbian woman who is here in Harvard Square helping run a homeless shelter, a lot of things, you are being a positive role model. You are showing that people can do something to help. You don't have to get up and give speeches or anything like that to be a positive role model. You just have to live your life in a way that you, when, when you look back on it, you can be proud to have lived. And I think if, if you live that way, you will be a positive gay role model for all the people you come in contact with. And that's really what I have been seeing as I, as I go around, um, is youth starting to really take a, a big role in activism and not waiting for the rest of the community to do anything for them, not saying what can I get from the community, but saying how can I contribute to helping everybody else. I, I would agree with, completely with that. The, the, 
the empowering energy that the youth have themselves needs to be recognized more. And I think that looking at the young people as not as th these things, but as these things, these amazing individuals who have all this amazing energy and stuff that the gay community needs to harness to change the whole world. You know, that's the reality of it, as opposed to the other way around, which, I mean, even sometimes in our discussion tonight, we talk about the youth or, you know, how do we help them? But, I mean, as you just said, while, while they're waiting for the help to come, they're not really waiting. They're out there doing all this amazing stuff. So it's the realization of the strengths that the young people have. It's the realization of how the, their world is different, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and just a total humble approach, I think. I used to refer to the youth as, in my, in my presentations, I would say, you are our future. And I was corrected strongly one night by saying, no, we are your present. <laughs> and I think that's so true. They are leading us down the road to, to a wonderful future, and we need to listen to them. Thank you. We have time, unfortunately, for one more question, which is going to be this gentleman here. Yeah? We, we've been going this way. Pressure. He's been standing there, and then you came, and then you came. So we have time for one more question. And then we have a couple of brief announcements, which also include um, sharing a little food with each other. So please. Uh, thank you. It's a lot of pressure. I'm, uh, my name is John Kimball. You, you can say pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm not a Harvard student. I'm actually a Katrina evacuee from New Orleans. Um, and you guys have welcomed me, which is great. <laughs> so mine is sort of following, my question is following up on what was just said about how much we need straight allies and the sort of battling the inequality that we face. Um, and that is how much other, other groups uh, and communities need us um, and how much our activism needs to be directed at things that actually aren't limited in any way to sexuality, the issues of racial inequality, uh, poverty, um, you know, uh, not limited in any way to, to sexuality. How, mu how much as a, as a community, as a, a community of activists, do we sort of uh, close ourselves off and we focus only on issues that affect us personally? We should all just be good citizens. Uh, bottom line is we should all just be good citizens and not, not be worrying so much about what we're going to uh, do for ourselves or what we're going to do for others, which is what Maya's been saying all night. My comment about the gay community needing straight allies is that by sheer numbers alone and voting, you, you need to figure out a way to engage us, but we also need to figure out a way to engage you um, in, in all civil rights issues and in all good citizenship issues. It's just really that simple. And, and there's been such a wall between uh, my demographic and your demographic for so long based on ignorance and fear that we just need to tear that wall down. And, and we just need help in trying to figure out how to, how to do that. And that would require talking to each other. And it requires turning it away from this. Again, we've mentioned this before, but spending time working out our own sense of whether or not we're OK is not going to get us anywhere. We are great. We're not just OK. And God loves us. So what is there to worry about? So basically, we can forget the whole worrying about acceptance thing and group together with everybody who agrees that love is a great thing. And then we can move forward to the rest of humanity and you know, find all the other causes that you know, still actually need some help. So that's what you're seeing again in these gay straight alliances. I mean, it's amazing. These, these groups, they'll spend like 20% of their time raising money for the gay straight alliance, but then they'll also go out and again have a car wash for Katrina victims or for you know, some other cause. And that shows that it's not a little side group that we're experiencing. Terrific. Chris and Meyer, any final comments? Um, Chris? I just wanted to throw in, um, if you know Gay Youth at Risk, the hotline that I work for at Fenway, 800-399-PEER, um, P-E-E-R. -E uh, P -E -E -R. Um, and it's a way for people just, uh, people under 25, the peer line, to talk, to have someone to talk to. It's anonymous, it's nationwide, and if you know someone at risk, um, please have them use it. Great. And finally, there are a few thank yous in order. Oh, yeah. Mike? Well, um, it's not from me. It's more from all of us. Thank the com uh, I'm supposed to thank the community organizations that helped to bring everybody to this event. 
Um, obviously, I'd like to thank all of you to come, for coming to the event. The following organizations are the Human Rights Campaign, uh, PFLAG, which is an amazing organization, the Harvard, yes. Like, talk about, like, this, never mind, like, the moms, and they're the most inspiring people in the entire world. That's just really what it comes down to. The Harvard Gay and Lesbian Caucus, the Religious Coalition for the Freedom to Marry, the Governor's Commission on Gay and Lesbian Youth, Keshet, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Integrity, which I believe is the Catholic organization. Episcopal. Episcopal. And Cambridge Welcoming Ministries. So Give thanks hand, to all those organizations. And finally, uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, Bill White at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, this is our second year here. Uh, and we've been pleased to be here and to be hosted by Bill White and uh, the Institute of Politics. Uh, special thanks to uh, Brian Liu, Dr. Brian Liu of HRC. <laughs> and my partner, Jewel Gilbert, who has helped me pull this off two years in a row and I couldn't do it without him. So. <laughs> Thank you all. The partnership begins with each of us going out and doing what we need to do. And uh, I'd like to invite you to stay and come backstage and, and share some food with us. Thanks again. Thanks, uh,